Greetings, brethren. This is Biblical Science with Emmanuel Fernandez. Today I'll be talking about three highly controversial topics. All have to do with uh, Calvinism. First of all, I'm not a Calvinist, but uh, unlike the world, I believe in eating the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, we all like our meat boneless. When I say meat, knowledge or wisdom. We don't want any work involved. We want our truth to all be packaged nicely, you know, all with no controversy. Oh yeah, that's what he's saying is truth because I don't have to do no research. No, because Calvinism, is there some bones you can choke on? Absolutely. One of them is limited atonement. But don't tell me there's no meat. There's a lot of meat in Calvinism, a lot of meat that can be backed by scripture, and that's what this, the point of this video is about. Uh, this video is going to be about Calvinism. What I what is scriptural about it and what is not. Uh, so first, I'll be talking about what is not scriptural about it, what is false, and also what it is at the end. And I'll back scripture which uh, each one. Frankly, I believe Calvinism, Calvinist John Calvin. Some of his works were doctor were let's say added on to by other people and if you've been following my ministry you know what I'm talking about the Jesuit order because let's start with Martin Luther with the Jews and their lies if you know your history true history you know he didn't write that it's not his writing he was saved he knows better that he's a spiritual Jew and he's gonna his father is Abraham and he's going to New Jerusalem so why would he write on Jews and their lies by the way that book came out when he was dead it's not his style of writing not his teachings his Jesuit order wrote that just like the Jesuit order wrote Mein Kampf is Hitler's a moron he was a homosexual I read newspapers I told you before eight videos all these guys you think they're smart they're really stupid Jesuit right Jesuits have Vatican archives of all their works, and they give it to them. I think uh, Thomas Edison, I know Thomas Edison is one of them. He's not who he, you think he is. He's a moron. They stole the works from Nikola Tesla, you know about him? And gave it to Edison. I think, I can't prove with Ed, uh, with Einstein, but I think he's a blithering idiot. He was dyslexic. He couldn't cross the street. He couldn't tie his shoes. I think the Jesuit order for him serving the Pope gave works of from other God-fearing people, the guys that really know something, and give it to Einstein. So like I say, eat the meat, spit out the bones. We we just been fed this meat of this false history, false science. Everything you learn from history is false. Science is false. But you don't want to take the work to find out the truth. Don't worry, I'm going to spoon feed you some truth right now. But I'm not going to spoon feed you all of them. Find out the truth on your own. Okay? The Christian obeys the truth finds out the truth because he has a Holy Ghost that agitates his conscience to go find out the truth. Okay, don't believe what I'm saying here. Find out for yourself. I'm not going to convince you of anything. I'm guiding you towards the truth like the Holy Ghost guides me towards the truth. So with Calvinism, I think, I I can't prove it, but I don't think everything works of his. I think the Jesuits is in his readings. Which one? Well, the ones that's not scriptural. Well, let's go by what he believes. He believed then you could be predestined to go to hell. Now, with just one verse of scripture, I can blow that out of the water. God does not predestine you to go to hell. He has the foreknowledge of you, of you that you think that He knows you're going to hell. But we think foreknowledge and predestination are the same thing. Remember, the devil is a miscegenator. A Christian is supposed to divide the word of truth. The devil, oh, it's all the same. Foreknowledge and predestination, the same thing. No, it isn't. God, no, he who has not believed in me is condemned already. Okay, the, the other scripture I'm going to pull is from Peter. God is not willing that all should perish, but that all should come into repentance. Now, my hermeneutics says I read the Bible literally. I don't read it allegorically, like most people do. Uh, he doesn't mean like that. What gives you the right to twist God's words? You know, God... God's word is magnifying above his name. If you add or take away from this book, God will much rather have you blaspheme his name than pervert his word. Do you know that? 
His word is magnified above thy name. So be very really careful when you try to add and subtract from the word. King James Bible. Because God said, hey, you better off cursing me than doing that. So I'm going to go about going over Calvinism. What I believe is scriptural. Well, I know it's scriptural. And what I believe is, I don't think even he said, I think it's a Jesuit order putting words in his mouth. Just like they did with Luther and his, the Jews and his lies. He did not write that book. Many of you think he did. Uh, he believes in predestination. He predestined people to go to hell, but I just, from First Peter, or Second Peter, you need to explain to me that verse, that he, God did not wish all should perish. Now, what does that all mean? Does that mean Christians say? No, I'm going to take it literally. I think he means everyone. Secularly, everyone. Saved or not saved. So that blows it apart right there. Don't confuse foreknowledge with predestinations, which we do. So I'm against that. Uh, I'm also against uh, total depravity. His version of it. He thinks we do not have the ability to repent or to believe. We need irresistible grace, which I believe in, which is scriptural. That is the only way to get saved. I don't think so. I think God can call you to be saved and you can accept his calling or he can choose you choose you to be saved. It's still the elect, but there's a chosen elect and the called elect that accept the calling. But Calvin, no. He does not believe that. He believes there's only one way of election and that's chosen elect, which he, he's half right. Man does not have the ability to believe, so they cannot believe. Man does not have the ability to repent, so he cannot repent. Well, here's a scripture in Acts. I command you to repent. Well, I can't repent. John Calvin said I can't, which I think Jesuit order is in his works. I don't think he meant that. Well, he could, but he's off on that point. Uh, I think total depravity is this. Man has the ability to believe, but he will not Man has the ability to repent, but he will not. There's a scripture in Genesis, way before Jesus Christ, way before the Bible, of a man knowing it was wrong to commit adultery with this woman. Like I said, I'm a Berean. I want you to be one too. So I'm not going to go, turn to Genesis. To, to, no, no, no. You go for it. So well, how do you know it's in there? Trust me, I know it's in there. As of a guy, why? Because... There's a YouTube video of Brian Delaniger on YouTube Ministry, and he pointed out that scripture to me. I just don't remember right now. So, no, you be a Berean. You go in it. That's my point right here. We want everything to be hand-delivered to us, every truth, like a waiter. No, you go in the scripture, and you find out that scripture in Genesis. There's a passage where a guy knows that what he was doing was wrong. Well, how does he know what he was doing is wrong? I thought you can't repent. You can't believe. Well, because the God law wrote the law in our hearts. We have an innate ability to know what's wrong and right, morally. Could that be why? There's certain cultures around the world where they have laws. They're not Bible-believing Christians, but they align strangely with the commandments. I wonder why. Or maybe because the law is written on their hearts. Now, you don't kill. You don't have to, I don't need the Bible to know that it's wrong to kill. I don't need the Bible to know that it's wrong to... To kill, to commit adultery. You know that was a capital crime in Israel? Murder? God's law is written on your hearts. That verse of scripture blows out total depravity. John Calvin's view of total depravity right out the water. John says, man does not have that ability to repent and to believe. Well, God says otherwise. Okay, I command you to repent. God commands everyone to repent. Well, how can you do it if you can't? God says otherwise. He written the law in your hearts. Yes, you can. Okay? But then again, if you willfully ignorant, don't want to believe, don't, don't mess, change the words, or mix the words that the devil does. Don't mix the words with can't to will not. Do they sound the same? No. I will not. I refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I can't believe him. Is that the same? Let's flip it. Let's invert it. I can't believe in Jesus Christ, so I will not. That makes no sense, and that's not scriptural. 
That's what many people say. I know I can't. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't believe. No. Laws written on your hearts. Jeremiah, I believe. You will not. Don't confuse can't or will not. You choose. It's a choice. You will not accept Christ. Therefore, you can't. I will not repent. Then I can't. As a man thinketh in his heart, so so shall he will be. So shall he is he. You think of that in your heart? You will not repent? You can't. You are what you believe in your heart. I believe in my heart I can't repent. I No, not I can't repent. I will not repent, so I can't repent. I will not believe, so I can't believe. So total depravity. I believe it somewhat with Calvary. He didn't get it totally right. I believe in ultra depravity, which is scriptural. The depraved will of man. I'm going to go all over the tulip. That's a T of the tulip. Total depravity. Okay? Uh, I don't believe in total depravity. I believe in ultra depravity. Man can believe, but he will not. Man can repent, but he will not. God calls him to be saved. No one comes to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him to me. You don't go to Jesus Christ. The Father tells you to go to Jesus Christ by drawing him to his Son. You don't seek after God. God seeks after you. So that's why I believe in the next, the you of the tulip. That why I believe it, because that's scriptural. Unconditional, ne unconditional election. Since you will smack away God's calling, his holy calling, he has to choose you to be saved. Unconditional ne election. Where, where there's scripture for that? I'm going to go to that right now. How... There's two ways, there's two types of elect in heaven right now. The chosen and the called. I, I, believe, I know I'm the chosen because he called me and I said, I don't think so. I'm not accepting your calling. So he sent his irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. But let's go about unconditional election. What is unconditional election? There's no condition for you to be, to, to be elected. There's nothing you do. You don't have a choice. God chose you. It's done. It's like me being a millionaire, giving you a million dollars. You have to do something for it? No. You have to endorse the check, accept it? No, I'm not giving you a check. I'm giving you cash. Here you go. Why do you choose me? Because it pleased me. Why did God choose me? Because it pleased them. No, there's no condition. That's what unconditional election means. Let's go in the Bible, find some scriptural evidence for that. Unconditional election. Chosen. Like I said, your hermeneutics of the Bible has to be not allegorical. Oh, he doesn't mean that. That word right there doesn't mean what it is. No. God says what he means and means what he says. Every word is there for a reason. If you tell me that he called you and there's no such thing as unconditional election, why did he use the word chosen? Is chosen the same thing as called? Like I'm calling people to have a birthday party. I'm calling someone up. You want to come to our birthday party? No. The birthday party is for my daughter. Do I have to call her to come to her own birthday party? That's what you're saying. Yeah, I do. But but it's not a surprise. I, I'm telling her I'm going to throw a birthday party. Do I have to call? Do I have to invite her to her own birthday party? Those are people that just believe you're going to be saved by God calling you. Yeah, you agree with that. No. I'm, I'm throwing a birthday party for my goddaughter. Call people. Can you want to come to my goddaughter's birthday party? No, I'm, not. I'm busy. Okay. I'm letting her know. This is my God, though. Hey, I'm throwing a birthday party for you. Okay, fine. Do I have to invite her to own her birthday party? No. I chose her. I chose to celebrate her birthday. God's the same way. Okay? It's unconditional election. Before I go into the scripture, let me go into further. Unconditional election is very deep. A lot of layers to it. Who did God choose? I'll tell you who he didn't choose. The world. Well, he died for the world, absolutely. But God has a primary purpose to saving people. Just like he has a primary purpose for hell. Hell wasn't for you. Hell was for the devil and his angels. Why? Because the Bible said so. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared. Was made for. But why am I going to hell? Because just because God purposed hell for the devil doesn't mean you cannot partake of that damnation. Jesus Christ chose his elect. 
I'm going to get into that who it is in a minute. But that doesn't mean everyone can part can't partake of it. Unconditional election means this. God chose you because you will not repent because you don't want to. So he chose you. There's nothing thing in, that goes into that chosen. Who did he choose? Well, his Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. His Jewish people first, and then the Gentile elect. He came to choose. He came to save primarily the body of Christ. Before the world even came to existence, God handed Jesus Christ the book. Here's a list of who you got to save. Notice at the top of the list. I'm God speaking to my son. Notice on the top of the list. Priority. Jews first, then the Gentile. They all elect. These are the chosen people. Call the, he calls everyone else. But he knows everyone else does not accept his calling. Because he knows already who's going to heaven and hell before he even created heaven, hell. He knows who's going there before you even came to existence. So unconditional election. Let's go into scripture now. How God chose you. Okay. Ephesians 1 4. Again, if God, if God says He called people, why does He use the word called? That's all I'm saying. God's not the author of confusion, the devil is. Let's see which word He decides to use in this scripture. Ephesians 1 4. According to as He hath chosen. There you go. Us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him. Like I said, I'm not a one verse theologist. I'm going to keep going. I'm a Berean. I'm not going to, there you go, there's one verse. No, because we like to be spoon fed things. Okay? we Our sinful nature is stubborn in, when it comes to the truth. So I'm going to keep going. Ephesians, the very next verse, one five. Having predestinated, now here's the thing with predestination. I don't believe in predestination to hell, but of course I believe in predestination to heaven because that's what unconditional election is all about. Predestination. Does he use that word? Let's find out if he uses that word. Having predestinated, there you go, us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did he choose you? Because he felt like it. It pleased him. Same reason why he created you. Oh, no, it's got to be because I'm good. God loves everyone. No. Because it pleased them. Do you have any more scripture of that? Absolutely. Do you know his angels? This is for his angels. Remember, God's providential in everything he does. He doesn't He doesn't do it like this. Okay, I'm going to primarily save these people. But everyone can partake. But this way, I'm doing this different. No. Hell is primarily for the devil and his angels, but everyone that reject Christ can go there too. Salvation is of the Jews; it's primarily for his Jews, but everyone can partake of that too. You think he he's gonna make it any different to his angels? Do you know God knew who, who's gonna what angels are gonna fall before the, even they did? When God knew the angels are gonna fall, don't you think he had to do something to just prevent all of them from falling? What is that? Chose them to be saved, not to fall. Where's that in scripture? I'm going to get to it right now. Unfortunately, there's only one verse I can paint for this, but my, I, I did that. I'm not saying one verse does not prove things. I'm just saying to be a Berean, prove that you know the Bible, come up with one verse. Why, why do you come up with one verse for this doctrine? Well, I believe this is the only verse I can find. Does any of them help me find it? But here's one verse. This is good enough because it's plain. It's in plain English. There's no way you can contort and twist it. Although people will try. God elected his, his angels, just like he elected his chosen people to be saved. Why? So they all won't perish. Okay? Why does the gate towards destruction? Well, how does he God prevent all everyone from going to hell? How does he prevent that? Choosing some people to go to heaven? He'll call on everyone, but he gotta choose someone because he knows who's going to hell. But majority's going to hell. That's why he's gotta choose people. He did that to his angels too. I know a third of them are gonna fall. Why only a third? Why not all the angels? Because I chose to save the rest of them. What is that in scripture? Here we go right here. 1 Timothy 5.21 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels 
that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing, nothing, doing nothing by partiality. He was impartial. He didn't say, Archangel Michael, he's a good angel. I need him. He's a he's doing a good job. Me save him, Gabriel. No. You, 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 and you, I chose you to be saved. Why? Because he pleased me. There's nothing that you did. That's above every other angel because every of them is equal before my eyes. I'm not a respecter of persons. That goes to that goes to angels as well as people. You, you, and you, you're saved. Done. Done deal. Did he, did he call upon uh, Michael? Do you want me to prevent you from falling? Did he say that to Michael? The no. He chose him. Unconditionally. Election. Like he did with his chosen elect, the Jewish people and the Gentiles. The body of Christ is the Jew first, then the Gentile. He chose them. No, they had they didn't have a say in the matter of their salvation. The angels didn't have a say. If they did, point to me in Scripture. Point to me where it says the Bible. Okay, the Bible. God calling this angel to not to fall. And the angel's like, Nah, I'm gonna go ahead and fall. I'll go choose to be with Satan. No. No. Do you have anything more of unconditional election? Of calling? Absolutely. Remember, there's two types of elects, the called and the chosen. Well, here's the called right here. Why? Because he uses that in the scripture, called. He doesn't say chosen in the scripture. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who hath saved us and called us, called us, with a holy calling. That sounds like chosen. No. Chosen is not in the scripture. Remember, I read it literally. Not according to our works. See, I'm not preaching work salvation. Oh, he saved you because you did good works, or you're a good person. No, not according to our works. But if you want to change the English language to change what that means, go ahead. Alle you want to be allegorical? Change it, go ahead. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, before the foundation of the world. A Berean find scripture that relates to each other, points it out to you, before the foundation of the world, before the world began. That God's saying the same thing using different words. Well, can he do that with called and chosen? No, because sounds like he wants you to know that he called them. Why? Because he says it twice. First he says, he called us with an holy calling. Why, Why didn't he just say, called us, or just holy calling? No, I think he wants you to to know that, hey, guys, I, I call people and they can choose to reject me. But then I, I chose people. Why? Because I use those words. Okay. So unconditional election. Total depravity. I don't believe the way he says it, John Calvin. I believe we can. We will not. We reject his call. Unconditional election. Absolutely, I believe in unconditional election. He predestined chosen people to be saved before the foundation of the world. Why? Because there's scripture backing that up. Limited atonement. That's the L in the tulip. Absolutely not. I will be contradicting God's word. Do you know you get a reward in the judgment seat of Christ on how you abide by God's word? You know, God would rather have you blaspheme his name than pervert his word. He has magnified his word above thy name. So he'd rather have you curse him than pervert his word, add or take away from it. So limited atonement, absolutely not. I don't believe in it. I believe in full atonement. For God so loved the world. Is that a Christian world or secular world? No, I think, uh, I read it literally. I don't think he's allegorically speaking there. I don't think he's using a parable. I think he means the whole world. For God so loved, loved. He doesn't love you now. He loved you. I'll get that in a second. Uh, God does not love lost sinners. I'll get to that next. He uh, loved, past tense, the world. So that all who's willing to come partake on his bread will not perish. All. But you know, all will not come to Christ, so he has to draw him to Christ with that calling. And you know, even that, people will reject this calling, so he has to choose them. So no, I don't believe in limited atonement, that he just came to save his... Limited atonement is just that, just. He just came to save his chosen, elect, that's it. Everyone else cannot come to Jesus Christ, no. He doesn't call no one. He just chose certain people to be saved, and that's it. No, I do not believe that. 
that contradicts John 3.16 and contradicts 1 Peter. God does not contradict himself. He cannot deny himself. He cannot lie. So no, I do not believe in limit atonement. What's the I? Irresistible grace. Well, irresistible grace is not the calling. Is God chosen you like he chose the angels not to fall. So of course I, be, I believe I believe in un irresistible grace. Okay, he did that with me. Like I said, he called me several times. And I reject his calling. So he gave me that irresistible grace, that pricking of the heart, that godly sorrow, that worketh repentance resulted in a changed heart. That's irresistible grace. Why? Because I felt something coming over me that I couldn't resist. Certain people, they call them and they get saved. Certain people, he has to choose to get saved. Why? Because I just got saved this year. Certain people, why do we think certain people get saved like 18 years old? And why do you think people get saved that when they're 40 years old? Well, maybe because he chose to, he calls on them and knows that they're going to accept. In a way, calling and chosen can be interpreted as the same thing because he has the foreknowledge. But why does he want you to differentiate the two? Because that's dependent on the reward you get in the judgment seat of Christ. Don't tell me God's going to reward you the same way he rewards a chosen person as to a called person. No, he's not going to reward me like he rewarded someone that he called and they accepted his calling. No, he's not going to give them the same rewards. That's why he wants to know. He wants you to know the difference between called and chosen. You think he's going to give the? He's going to reward me the same way he's going to reward someone 18 years old that got saved that accepted his calling to so someone that's stubborn that took him to be till he was 35 years old to get chosen to get saved. No, he's not going to. He's not going to reward them the same way, but he loves us the same way. We're both the elect. So irresistible grace, absolutely. Why? That scripture right there, irresistible grace, connects with unconditional election. The Bible proves it. So biblically, total depravity, the way John Calvin says it. No, it's not biblical. Unconditional election. Is it biblical? I just point out, yes. Limited atonement. No. Why? Because it's non biblical. All should come to repentance repentance. He's willing not he's not willing that all should perish. I believe in full atonement. Irresistible grace, absolutely. Because that type, that's the grace that the way he chose who to be saved and who not. Why? Because it pleases him. Per preserver, preserve pre preservation of the saints is the P in the tulip. Again, that ties into unconditional election. He preserved the saints before the foundation of the world. And I don't even need to go into the scripture because I just did. Preserving means you're not dying until you get saved. I could have died a, long t a lot of times. I could have got hit. I was almost hit by a car. I could have got killed in Cape Verde, which is my homeland, where my parents from. A guy pulled a knife on me. He could have stabbed me to death. Why didn't you die? Because God didn't chose, because I didn't, He didn't chose me to be saved yet. He didn't. Uh, he preserved me until He chose me. That's what preservation of the saints. You're a saint if you're saved means. You won't die until God pricks your heart. If He chose you to be saved, you can be a soldier in the army, be infected with Ebola, astronaut, all these dangerous jobs. You're not dying. Until you know you're saved. Remember, God wants you to know you're saved. God's not about blind faith like all these religions are about. That's in the Bible too. Where is it in the Bible that he wants you to know to be saved? Uh, be a Berean. Find out for yourself. I'm not going to spoon feed you everything. God wants to know. There's that word again. Words. Know and believe is the same thing. No. I believe I'm a man. I know I'm a man. Is that the same thing? I believe that I'm a, a man, a masculine. I know I'm a man. I don't need to pull my pants down to know that I'm a man. I know I'm a man. God wants to know you have ever everlasting life. He'll preserve you until you know. So preservation of the saints? Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree with that. So I just broke down the tulip. What's scriptural and not scriptural? What are you going to talk about next? How about God loves you. Love kills. I went to 29 minutes in this video. The rest is going to be about this love business because that's the reason why a lot of people are going to hell. So I think it's kind of important because I'm going to dedicate the rest of this video to this love business. What are you talking about? Well, this heresy, this satanic doctrine that God loves everyone the same. 
saved and not saved. He extends his grace to everyone equally the same, saved and not saved. No, that is not scriptural. We'll point to scripture in it. I'm about to. Who are you going to point to? It? Well, you, you know you're a priest and you're saved. Let's talk about your high priest. You know your, who your high priest is, right? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the high priest at the, at the order of Melchizedek. If you're a priest, shouldn't you do what your high priest teaches? Well, what does Jesus Christ teach us? Well, salvations of the Jews. Yes, my gift is for everyone, but primarily for my people. Jesus Christ was a racist and he's a bigot. I, no one comes to the Father but by me. No one. Not the Jew or the Gentile because he's not a respecter of persons. He's a racist, a bigot, and he's a sexist. Well, prove that. Well, I'm going to prove that all three of them in one, in one uh, instance of Scripture when he's talking to the Canaanite women about not casting my bread is not for you, it's for the house of Israel. Let's get into that. I was I was only giving you parts of that story, but let me spoon feed you since you you like boneless chicken. You don't like to find the truth on your own. I'm sorry to feel offensive, but that's the way we are. Don't tell me that's not the way we are. We're lazy when it comes to finding out the truth. So don't worry, I'm gonna spoon feed you right here. Let's go to that instance of scripture. Matthew fifteen twenty four. Okay, this is, let um, me set it up. This is Jesus Christ preaching to his people, the Jews, and a Canaanite woman, a black woman, comes up to him saying, my daughter's been possessed by the devil. Please help me. Let's see how this loving Jesus Christ, this guy's a care bear. He loves everybody the same. He loves because he's not a respecter of persons. You don't think I can't twist, twist scripture? He's not a respected person, so that means he loves everybody the same. He gives his grace to everyone. He loves people that reject him. Well, let's see if he loves this woman at first. Matthew. And behold, Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the, de with the devil. Son of David. Hmm. Do you know Jesus Christ was the son of David? You know he's been sitting on a Davidic throne in the millennial reign? A thousand years. Was that a literal? Yeah. He's going to really sit on a throne, literally. A thousand reign, literally, in the millennial kingdom. I thought he's sitting on his throne right now in heaven. No, that's his father's throne. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father, waiting his enemies to be made his footstool. That's his Father's throne, not his throne. His throne is on earth, the Davidic kingdom. David was a Jew. Of course he was. Abraham was a Jew. Of course he was. Yeah, he's a racist. Salvation is of the Jews. But he answered and uh, but he answered her not a word. Well, this loving Jesus, he loves this woman so much, he ignored her. Back in the day, Women would looked as inferior, but thanks to feminism, women are equal with men now. But back in the day, you know, women, they looked down upon. You know that? When a woman comes up to a man, the man is not at liberty to answer him. No. That's how it is with Saudi Arabia. If a woman does that in Saudi Arabia, they'll probably put to death if he goes against her husband. What? That's why God's blessed even the un, even the unsaved. If they're righteous, as He blesses them. Go to Saudi Arabia, see who's boss, the man or the woman. Jesus didn't answer her at first; he ignored her. That that Jesus Christ, he's a care bear. Oh, he must not heard of her. He he must not hear what she was saying. He he did not ignore her. He was uh he was doing something else. He didn't hear her. No, I think he heard her. He didn't answer her not a word. Okay, he's a sexist. If this was a man, he probably would have answered him the first time. But he was, she was a woman. So he's like, answer her, not a word. But if you want to twist that scripture, go ahead. No, he does not mean, okay, go ahead. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. The men, his disciples, which are all men, remember Jesus Christ is a sexist and a racist, came to Jesus and said, Jesus, this woman's 
So this woman here, this weaker vessel, she's freaking, she's a, uh, she's a constantly bothering us for you to help her. Can you send her away, please? This Canaanite woman, this Gentile woman, she's not even Jewish. We're not obligated to love her because she's probably not saved. We're not obligated to even hear what she's saying. Why? Because she's not even Jewish. Forget that she's not even a man. She's not even a Jewish. She's a Gentile woman. Can you send her away, Jesus, please? Send her away. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of Israel. Oh, this Jesus Christ, he sends his love equally. He loves everybody equally. That's why he said, I was sent for the lost sheep of Israel, the house of Israel. Listen, women, that I ignored. This is Jesus Christ talking to the Canaanite woman. I'm being sarcastically, but I'm doing this to prove a point. Listen, I came to save, save my, primarily, my Jews. My bread is for my Jewish people. House of Israel, you're a Canaanite Gentile woman. I didn't come, I was not sent here for you. Sent. Everyone can partake of my bread. My primary purpose is for the Jews, salvations of the Jews. Let's see how she responds. Well, first of all, Jesus goes on. It is not my, it is not meant meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Look at this Jesus Christ. He loves her so much. He calls her a pet dog. He loves he loves her so much. Jesus Christ calls her a pet dog. In your eyes you are a pet dog compared to his Jewish people? Yeah. You're a pet dog. This is me petting a dog. You're a Gentile dog. Okay, don't tell me Jesus Christ loves his chosen Jewish elect the same way he loves his Gentile. Like, I don't think so. He told his woman, my bread is not to be cast to the dogs. Okay? Okay? In this instant, I am a respecter of persons. Salvation is of the Jews. And how does he respond? Forget you, Jesus walks away like men of us do today. No. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs of the fall for the master's table. You're right. You have not come to, you, you didn't chose to come save me. You come to chose save your Jewish elect, the body of Christ. But can I get some crumbs? Please, Lord. She came in a repentant state. Okay. Then Jesus answered, O woman, great is thy faith. O unto thee, even as thou wilt, your daughter will be made whole in, from that very hour. Remember, Jesus Christ had the full knowledge of what she's going to say before she said it. Okay? But notice Jesus Christ didn't put... Let me just forget what I'm doing here, preaching to my Jewish people. Let's, let me, since I love everyone equally, let me go ahead and run to this Canaanite, non-Jewish woman and do what she says right now. Save her daughter. Why? Because I love everyone. Sure he does. He ignored her, first of all. Corrected her. I came for the house of Israel. Told her who his bread was for. It's for the house of Israel, not for you, you pet dog. That's a racist, sexist, bigoted statement. How? Well, he ignored her, first of all. That's sexist. Racist statement, house of Israel. Bigoted. Salvations of the Jews. You can only be saved. Jesus Christ was a Jew, Yeshua HaMashiach. You can only be saved through me. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's a bigoted statement. If you claim you're saved, you better be a sexist, a racist, and a bigot. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ was. You're a priest? Well, he's the high priest. You're supposed to do the will of your high priest. So, Einstein says, if you cannot explain it to a child, you don't know it. 39 minutes, I feel I said my piece of this love business, how God loves everybody equally. I think I said my piece of this Calvinism, that there's some scriptural evidence in that. We Christians, as soon as we see one thing wrong with it, we discard everything. No, that's not the way. Eat the meat, spit out the bones. You want boneless chicken? Here's some boneless chicken. 
It's in the King James Bible. Nothing but meat, no bone in it. Is, is this some boneless chicken that you need to be aware of? Yes. The church. There's there's the church. There's poisonous chicken everywhere. So let me go ahead and with this. God does not love everyone. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Thank you.